Coming up on today's episode, Elon teases a small cyber truck for Europe. Astronomers find mysterious objects that are in a circular formation in the sky and they don't know what it is. And SpaceX does everything. Let's get ludicrous. Hey there, and welcome to our ludicrous future. This is the podcast where we talk about all the cool future stuff that's happening today. It's going to make tomorrow totally ludicrous. Wow. You're I'm Joe Scott with the mode. Answers to Joe YouTube channel. With me is Tim Dodd. Hi there, it's me, Tim Dodd, and I didn't sleep for the past week. <laughs> and <laughs> with us this week, of course, is Ben Solens, who's going to be like, I'm a dad. I never sleep. What sleep? Never heard of it. Yeah. No, seriously. That's why my eyes look like this. Hey, guys. It's uh, Ben Solens. Here today oh. to explain tomorrow, and we were just talking about my my son's spaceship here that you guys might be impressed with if you've never seen one of these. How, what do you think, Tim? Is this other than being completely out of focus? It kind of looks like exactly what Starship looks like, right? <laughs> Pretty much exactly. S- well, Starship kind of changed a good amount since then, but. That's what Falcon 9 looks like when it lands. Yeah, there I'd say go. it's almost more akin to a Falcon 9. But but the reason why I wanted you to hang on to that was, the okay, so in legit, your son help, grabs that and calls it his spaceship. Correct. Yeah, he said, I okay. want to play spaceships. He grabs this little guy here. And it's what we're looking at is a little tiny GoPro, GoPro tripod yeah. that like extends. Yeah. Yep, but it's listeners. like, it looks, you know, just like cylindrical and then the legs pop out and then it extends up, you know. I mean. Well, the the reason... I was kind of like, I want to talk about this is this is what kids think of when they think of rockets, things yeah. that land. Right. Yeah. 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 That's cool. And we'll, we'll set up in the, in the living room, like, like launch areas and landing areas and kind of like launch from one to the other one. That's awesome. So, That's really cool I'll, to know that it's already like changed the next generation's mm-hmm. thing. So yeah. <sighs> Before and as always it, with yeah, us today say. are our <laughs> Discordian family. Hello, everyone in Discord who are Howdy, watching Discord. and listening live. And hey, Get Swifty, who just joined. Yeah, Get Swifty, just popping in at the last second. Woo, Mr. Fresh Wolf, fish, Carida, fresh fish. Bamboo <laughs> hip hop. What's we up, y'all? Buddy. Yes, Steve. I was born in Tejas, and I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> and I know it just makes Joe cringe every time I call it Tejas. If you want to be one of the uh, cool cats and kittens that can listen and watch live like our Discordian family is doing right now, you can learn more and sign up at olfpod.com slash Patreon. And like always, we ramble way too long on these episodes. So if you don't have that kind of time, I get it. Uh, neither do I, frankly. Um, <laughs> but... If you want to just see the highlights, the little news bits, you can learn more and subscribe for free at olfpod.com slash highlights. Just another YouTube channel with just smaller, you know, segmented chunks. So you can also just search you on YouTube and be like, our Lucas future highlights and you'll find it too. Yeah. Somewhere on the Depends. things and the tubes Some before like it gets going banned. going to websites. You know? Those are spooky. Keep me safe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't... There it is. So, so SpaceX we... did all the things, huh? Uh, yeah, do we need to start there? I feel like it was like the biggest. <laughs> That's why everybody's listening, I think. Well, Joe, I, I saw, uh, I saw is... several comments that were like, I can't wait for OLF this week. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, it's been a huge week where like I literally was streaming, I feel like almost nonstop since last, remember last week it was like Thursday morning, I'd already streamed for like five hours before we recorded last week. And then after that I recorded, I streamed again when they did the static fire. And then it was like just cranking out a video and then streaming on Sunday, streaming on Monday, streaming on Tuesday. It's just been nonstop. So let's first talk about what I think is probably the biggest thing to happen um, in space flight in the 20 in the at least in the like since the space shuttle. We'll just put it that way. Uh, And definitely (laughs) in the United States. We had a crewed vehicle coming home from space. Two All humans right. were Bob in orbit. Doug. They were on the International Space Station, and they came home from orbit. And uh, this was a huge, huge, obviously, probably the most important aspect of uh, of returning home or of, of the DM2 mission, the demonstration mission 2 for SpaceX and the crew of Dragon Capitals, making sure they can bring people home. Because at least on ascent, you have an abort system, right? Mm. Uh, when you come back in from reentry, you're just bound to the laws of physics. Like, there's it's nothing... True. There's no like backing out and being like, whoopsie doodle. Like, let's let's retry that. You know, you can't F9 Kerbal Space Program load Go your quick up. save. Yeah. 
So uh, it's definitely, and you know, the, the, the forces involved is, is insane. I did a video um, kind of going into how you, how you actually deorbit. And I didn't really get too much into it, but one of the things that people don't quite understand is the way that deorbiting works is you basically are just beginning to touch uh, thicker parts of the atmosphere. And then you let the atmosphere scrub off all of your velocities. Don't forget, you know, these things in orbit are traveling at about 28,000 kilometers an hour, 17,500 miles an hour for those of you metrically impaired. And, <laughs> you know, it's it's just absolutely screaming like 10 times faster than a bullet. And it, you have to remove that energy. It took that whole rocket's worth of energy to get it up to that speed. Now you have to remove it to get it down safe, right? You have to remove energy. And right now it's kinetic energy. It's moving, again, 10 times faster than a bullet. You have to take, get rid of that kinetic energy. And so what it's doing is it's, it's hitting the atmosphere. The atmosphere is, uh, is compress, it's compressing the air in front of it, in front of the heat shield. Uh, when it compresses the air, obviously the air can't get out of the way fast enough, so it slows it down. But also then it's compressing the air. And the air, when it gets compressed, heats up so much that it turns into a plasma. So all it's doing is converting, basically it's converting kinetic energy and dissipating is turning it into heat. Just like a brake pad, actually. A brake pad on a car really is doing about, it's, it's more friction and the friction turns it into to heat, right? That's what brake pads do. They take all that kinetic energy and they remove it by, by trying to stop it and clamping force and eventually rejecting it as heat. That's like how you, that's what it ends up being is heat. Um, it's the same thing, only really it's not air friction. It is just compression of the of the wind stream. And you got to do that. And then so in doing that, your your spacecraft ends up experiencing parts of it like half as hot as the sun. Literally half as hot of the surface of the sun is how hot that heat shield will get or parts of the the plasma and stuff. So, yeah, this was a really big deal, obviously. Like this is this is really putting the what, what would you say? Putting the proof where the pudding is. What? The proofs Pedal in the pudding. The metal. <laughs> I don't know. Period on the sentence. <laughs> this is yeah. This is where. Oh, I can hear that. Yeah. So that's that was when uh, that was call out that we actually had the four main shoots. So basically, once it slows down enough down to terminal velocity, um, at only about fifty five hundred meters, they deploy first the four the two drogue shoots. Those will continue to slow it down again. Get it from you know basically uh, supersonic down to subsonic. Or probably not supersonic. I think it's already subsonic by the time those deploy. But uh, but yeah, then then the drogue shoots to uh, rip off basically, and they pull out four main. Look at that. How did they get audio of the splashdown? Ooh, did they actually have? Let me hear. Hang on. It did sound like it, but you know what I think that is? I don't... Somebody just like dropped something in water behind him for sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they hired like Foley artists for this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. uh oh, here come the conspiracy theorists. Question, actually. I, I wonder if that was splashed down, if it was audio from the, the capsule being broadcast, or if it was simply, you know, it could have been something like um, uh, where as soon as the mics ramped up, you know, because they had like a noise gate inside the studio, it just happened to be like... <laughs> Like the sound of like ambient noise in the background. Let's listen again. Man. It's because it, it almost <laughs> it sounds, sounds like, like a splash. It does sound like a splashdown. Sorry, those in Discord can't hear it, but it was. Uh, it sounds like you know they're quiet, and so therefore the mics aren't picking up anything. And then as soon as like. They're about to talk, you know, all of a sudden the, the noise gate pops up and you're hearing like someone mm. like clapping kind of the ambience of the room. I don't know. Conspiracy theory. <laughs> but anyway, they made it home safe and were welcomed by tons of Floridian boaters. Did that just that? drove me nuts. I could not believe that. Yeah. And the funny thing is some of my friends, you know, I'm telling them about it. Like, that to me? There were a bunch of people there in boats just waiting. Yeah, a yeah. bunch of just dudes in boats that just started going out there, like, right in the middle of everything. Like, in the middle of recovery operations with a spacecraft that just reentered space and was firing toxic, cancerous, highly explosive fumes as it's reentering with its hydrazine. Like, the things you do not want to breathe, you do not want to be anywhere near, and this thing's just splashing down, and all of a sudden you have just a bunch of Floridians, like, 
I like Florida. how I'm using Floridians as like a Florida man, like a... 36, uh, <laughs> <laughs> develops yeah. cancer. It's almost like this should have been like, yeah, go 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 right up to it. Go ahead. Right. So <laughs> just, just, I'm gonna, just I'm go kiss it. Pull up the the part where the people are in boats. I didn't hear that. Now, didn't they say it sounded like uh, a cat dying or something on the way down, or an animal screaming or something? When they asked him <laughs> in the press conference, like what it sounded like. No, they just more said that I think the rocket just was alive. It was less. Mecha- I think it was more the the rocket than. The- Were they talking about reentry? Yeah, they're talking or- about reentry. They said it. You know what the dragon capsule sounded okay. like. Okay, so that boat <laughs> in particular, that's not a recovery vessel. There's only two fast oh. boats that that get out there. So the, from- so they're still inside right now. They're still inside. Yeah. And this vehicle yeah, it took a while to get them out. Literally, the first thing that SpaceX uh, does is they go out there with with two fast boat. One recovers the parachute. The other one first goes up to the vehicle and sniffs it to make sure that it doesn't have hypergolic leaking, like uh, hydrogen leak leaking everywhere. Because again, that's like incredibly toxic. So again, that's another just boat. Mm-hmm. You can see the fishing poles on the back. Like oh, that's what that is. Okay. What? Yeah. That's madness. I, I feel like the uh, Coast Guard maybe should be involved here. Or like some helicopters flying low with some guns pointed like, look at, at these guys. Look at how close these boats this are. This is getting. America. Come on. You know, and people are going, well, it's the telephoto lens that make it. Less. No, it, it's. <laughs> yes, it's some of it. And you got, you know, people with oh, flags great. going by yeah. and taking pictures and doing all How many all their flat stuff. earthers are there saying, oh, <laughs> see? We got real life CGI. All right. <laughs> see what? See? That's how good. That's how good this is. It's just like the video games. They they know nothing about SpaceX, and they just think th- something fell out of the sky. Yeah. <laughs> no, here's here's what happened is they they do publish basically where they're going to splash down, and, and the Coast Guard gives out an aud- audible warning to all of the people in the vicinity, saying, "Hey, uh, you know, there's spacecraft recovery operations. Please do not approach this zone." Blah blah blah. The only problem is there was not nearly enough support to actually be able to, and this is only about 20 miles or like, sorry, uh, what is that? 32 kilometers off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. So definitely within like boating range of fisher, you know, fishermen and stuff. So they all kind of knew it was coming. They knew that was the prime landing site. And then once the coordinates were published and they could see the parachutes and stuff, they all just raced out to it. And the Coast Guard really didn't have, uh, well, I won't say the authority because they actually can legally board any vessel. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico and outside of the the 12 mile uh, like international waters region, they can still have jurisdiction there, but they just didn't have the the crew to enforce it. I mean, at this point you send the Navy, forget the coast guard, like send an actual, like, I mean, I guess I'm just thinking that cause San Diego, but dude, <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> like, you got some people that'd be there really quick if that was happening over here. Right. Like, well, all, all the splashdowns before were, Navy, right? Because they mm-hmm. had aircraft carriers. Or... Yep. And they would be was in the... an aircraft carrier? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Huge old aircraft car- mega thing. But that's also because it was yeah. in the middle of the Pacific, and they just yeah. needed that as a as a point to be mm. able to go recover the vessel. You know. So, so Bob and Doug land. They peek their head out, see all the boats <laughs> happening. They're like, "Can can we go back? Send us back. I'm out." <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not the, what I signed the up. The crazy for. thing is, like, you know, again, this isn't about. Well, it's, first off, it's like how frankly entitled self-entitled you have to be to be like i need to be yeah. here and take a picture from my facebook page <laughs> yeah you know what i mean suddenly like, they're gonna crack this whole thing open with their crappy iphone photo right or i mean i don't think it was conspiracy <laughs> theories i think it was generally people that were extremely excited to see this and that's great i trust me that's awesome i don't blame them if you know if if i knew that you could go see it and you could just boat right up to it how i mean how awesome would that be right but at the same time, like have a little bit of like, don't like they were it's there Florida, before man. the recovery don't vessel. Don't get your was hopes there. up. But it's not just <laughs> Florida. Like I feel like that's just people would do that anywhere, you know. Um, you know, a little bit of that cowboy streak, maybe in the South streak of like I'll do whatever I want. Maybe like this is America type of attitude is maybe a little bit more prevalent there. But like at the same time, like guys, you're literally interfering potentially with recovery operations. If you happen to go and ding that, that spacecraft with your boat, say all of a sudden your motor stalls and you no longer have, you know, like right as you're pulling up, you're, you know, reducing the throttle and all of a sudden your engine dies right when you're about to reverse thrust and, and, you know, prevent yourself from running into this thing. And now you puncture the whole of that and you could risk drowning two astronauts or puncturing, you know, again, uh, the 
hydrazine tank and all of a sudden it ruptures and you have mm. get noxious fumes and it, i mean it could be catastrophic right the boat, just we all saw beirut know. okay we all saw what happened oh god all right yeah that's that's what that's what they're playing with so well people close. in florida you know close taking... i mean it it's more noxious than that but it's not quite as I well i don't know if it's as explosive as is that but i mean obviously not I, the same i'm amounts. just trying to scare them to keep to get it <laughs> I'm, I'm not being well, serious yeah <laughs> um, but you know, the, the, the boats that approach the, the vehicle are, they have soft holes. They're, you know, they're rigid inflatable craft, you know, for that purpose too, mm -hmm. that it, as they're approaching the boat, if something were to happen, they, they just gently bump into it like bumper cars, normal boat holes. You don't want those anywhere near this thing. They got pointy ends, you know, like they, they, they could puncture it. And there, again, there's two humans and eventually there'll be four humans inside these things. The last thing you want is to have a boater just going up and accidentally interfering and having something happen and something could be catastrophic for not only for their own safety, but for the safety of those on board, the safety of the people trying to recover these vehicles. Like this is a whole operation and you don't have anything to do with it. You know? Yeah. Like I don't. So <sighs> go ahead, Joe. No, sorry. Were you saying a second ago that the, um, the previous splashdowns back in the sixties and seventies, that was like out in the middle of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm guessing we now have a level of accuracy that we didn't have back then. Yeah, actually, the, well, the funny thing is there's the level of accuracy is, I think, probably relatively similar because the cool thing is, mm. and I talk about it, I made a video explaining, you know, like how we reenter and stuff. One of the things that people don't under, don't realize is that even through reentry, the Dragon Capsule or any like even Apollo and stuff like that, they were guiding their reentry based on spinning the spacecraft because mm. what they do is intentionally like heat shield, although it's cylindrical or, you know, circular, they'll put the center of mass like it'll slightly be offset. And when you do that, you can literally almost like create a ramp and create some lift or at least a lifting vector. And so they can actually help steer it to its point. So either like come out of the atmosphere more if they're, you know, coming in too shallow, uh -huh. dive down like this. If they're coming in too high, you know, steer left and right, basically. I mean, a fine amount. And they can tune their their reentry down to a very high degree of accuracy. And they could do that through Apollo. But I, I bet these days they can do it to even a finer degree just with more advanced you know, computing and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so yeah, I don't really know why ex exactly they <laughs> just used to splash down to the Pacific, but that's not the, well, it, the case anymore. It's just, uh, it, it occurred to me after, you know, watching it, like, and probably from some of the, something that you said was that, um, I mean, yeah, there hasn't been a splashdown for what, like 20 years outside of like an accidental one that the Soviets had. Right. Or the Russians, I guess. Water um, landing. Yeah. Yeah. Water landing. But, but I mean, my point was like, we haven't done this in so long. And, and you were just saying that it was usually done like further out in the Pacific. So there's no real precedence for landing so close to land right. where like somebody on a fishing boat could just go out and do that. Right. So well, that's kind of what NASA should, said. People. Maybe it should just be expected. We just never really seen that happen before right. because it, it wasn't, you know, in a place where that could happen. I think, And that's exactly, I think uh, uh, Jim Bridenstine, NASA administrator, said in the post-launch press conference or the post-splashdown press conference, something like, you know, why didn't you guys anticipate this? He's like, honestly, we just didn't even, we didn't consider that people wouldn't heed the Coast Guard's <laughs> warning and just circumvent and drive out there themselves. Like, we just didn't think yeah. that next time we will have, you know, more security, we'll coordinate that with the Coast Guard, with the Navy, with SpaceX, you know, and, and including the people, the recovery vessels were strictly uh even requested not to enter like even to try to like get anyone away because that was not their job their job is to mm -hmm. focus on getting the crew home safe so they're not going to be driving around hey get out of here you know like they were yeah. busy yeah like, they're, they had they're a probably job not armed right right um well there might be some armed security on the main recovery vessel um but yeah they're not going to be this that boat's too slow to go out there and wrangle around a bunch of people on quick little you know boats but oh man <laughs> yeah i don't know <laughs> it was it was just kind of embarrassing it was america well they're back yeah. and well there's, there's one more <laughs> there's one more little story so remember how i mentioned get out you know, of like, the, get out of this dark hole we're in <laughs> well remember how remember how i said you know like you don't want to be anywhere near it because there could be toxic fumes well come to find out that's exactly what happened um, the first thing they do, like I said, is they sniff these, the vehicle basically to make sure that there's no hydrazine leaks. So they get it All up right, on the vessel guys. and, and they, and they had already done a sniff test, but once they opened up and, and were getting ready to actually open the main hatch, 
they are doing more sniff tests basically and and getting kind of into some cracks because there is there's the pressure vessel where the people are inside and then on top of that there's a whole like skirting and kind of this outer shell right and so as they were doing the sniff test they kind of noticed that there's some trace amounts of of hydrazine still and and this is this is, I mean, to be expected-ish, it was double the the lower threshold, or the upper threshold, I mean, so it was twice that of acceptable rates. And the reason is, you know, these thrusters are firing. The thrusters are basically punching out of the outer shell. But as they fire, as it re-enters, as wind, blah, 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 it could take some of that gas after they fire it, and it can kind of get it stuck in some of those cracks. And then they could just be stuck in, you know, in those gaps in between there. You know, there's no, now there's no airflow, like, you know, pushing or circulate or anything. So they really didn't have, like, it's not like it's dangerous, but it, we're talking about parts, like a few parts per million and a few parts per billion, you know, of this gas. So it's very, very, very low concentration, but out of like huge abundance of caution, they're like, we have mm -hmm. to get this down to below our, our registered threshold. And so what they did is they purged the entire system with nitrogen. And, uh, and that makes, so even those cavities just got purged with an inert gas, you know, nitrogen's in our atmosphere. It's inert. Um, and they said next time when they splash down, that might be just one of the first things they do as, even as the vehicle approaches, as the fast boats approach, they'll likely add a new thing that just purges, um, right away. Just to, I've just got to make a sure question for you. I've got a, why don't they just for you here and, and ad libbed one. Why don't, <laughs> since they're catching fairings, why don't they try to catch the capsule? We've talked about this like three times on the show. What? Man, see, Actually, I Actually, we did out. that as a why don't they just. Yeah, we've done that we? as a why don't they just. Yeah. Like, literally <laughs> right, well, twice. I'll, I'll go back and watch that. Here, I'll be back. <laughs> See you guys. But for that answer, uh, I always thought, like, there's, th it's substantially heavier than a fairing, like, five mm. times heavier than a fairing. And it, I, I just didn't assume it'd be smart to, to try to catch it. But then Elon later mentioned that they're probably going to start practicing with crew or with, uh, with cargo. So they could potentially try trying, to catch it. Trying to catch the actual dragon capsule, huh? The, yeah. Not the crude. The, and the crude one and the, well, the, the weight would slightly be different between yeah. the. Sim, I mean, close enough. Like, but like enough to where it wouldn't matter. Oh, enough where they could prove it out on cargo and see if it's safe. But again, it's like the whole risk factor. Is that actually going to keep the you know astronauts safe? What if they land on the edge of the net, tip over? And it you know, and fall it, off or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, they really, yeah. really just, it does not matter. Like, there's a few things that could be more efficient or a little bit quicker turnaround, but, like, does it make it safer? Does it yeah. really it reduce it? the risk for the, the people on board and the people recovering? Like, do you also want a highly pressurized, toxic propellant thing landing on top of a boat with people on it either? Like, or do you want it to splash down and then go recover it once everything's okay, you know? <laughs> yeah. Risk mitigation, you know, it's it's... Risk versus reward, and in this case, you're maybe speeding up something that takes half hour. You know, is that worth all? The Which is risk? like lightning quick in it seems in yeah. terms of anything. Like, what does it take to get your EVA shoot on? Like four hours or something crazy? Yes, literally. <laughs> like, yeah. So sitting, so thirty minutes, sitting, is like around in the it's... water for thirty minutes before the boat actually picks you up out of the water. That's nothing. Yeah. yeah. It, it will take... well, the, the bit the bit where they were like sniffing and waiting for the the leak to clear and the, the two guys were still in there and they kept checking in. I was like, hey, we're we're just checking. We're doing it. And they're like, yeah. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been sitting in this thing for tw 12 hours. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. But you could imagine I, I personally, if I was Bob and Doug, I would be a little bit more alert and and just a little bit more like ears perked up if they say there's like, trace amounts of hydrazine. Because remember, there was that loss of a dragon capsule. That mm. had a you know a a made like full blown loss of one where they're still sitting inside that kind of trapped in there, just really hoping that there's not an actual leak. But yeah, but I, I think they're that. yeah. But I think their you know their fears were were quelmed when you know when they just explained it and everything. But that's why communication is good, you know. Um, but yeah, it was honestly other other than then the trace amounts of of hydrazine, which really again is is still within like a totally normal threshold it just was too high to really want to open the the hatch up yet besides that and then the boaters flawless like absolutely flawless bob and doug said multiple times like we just can't believe how great this mission went and it just really felt like we're you know basically saying stuff like it feels like we're in the future now you know mm -hmm. yeah so yeah. huge congrats to spacex and nasa because 
we've been waiting for this for a long time and we're just so <laughs> glad that that Bob and Doug are safe and that everything just looks really good and they're still pushing forward for their first operational mission with with crew one already in uh shoot I forget now did it move to early September I think it moved to September but um yeah we're still only like a that's month not gonna already. be on a different dragon though right I mean they, they yep. want to reuse this one but probably not for that mission mm-hmm. I'm assuming and they will use this one already for crew two which I think we talked about last okay. week that they that they changed their mind about reusing them mm-hmm. and the yeah. reusing boosters. And now they're all ready from the demo between the time it's like the demo. And even before they fly their first one, they've already committed and said, yeah, we're we're confident about reuse, um, both with the booster and with the spacecraft. Which is awesome. Yeah, it's crazy. But I think it's a lot of that hop. was uh, I think a lot of that, by the way, was was because NASA's seen SpaceX refurbish the old cargo versions. You know, SpaceX flew almost half of the cargo, the crew, the Dragon 1 capsules. Uh, nine out of the 20 that flew were actually refurbished. So SpaceX had plenty of mm. experience showing that they know how to do it and that it's still a safe vehicle and that there was no issues arising from the refurbishment pr- process. So proof's in the pudding again. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it, it's funny when we're talking about the whole splashdown thing. Like I, I feel like there's probably room for them to iterate on the on the crew dragon to make it more of a I mean cause cause um <sighs> shoot. What's the mm-hmm. other one? Boeing the Starliner. Starliner. Yeah. Like they're they're gonna land on land. Right. So um I was kind of in my head thinking, well, they could probably uh kind of reconfigure crew dragon to land on land so there's not all this splashy stuff but then i thought but they're probably allocating all of their development resources to this other thing (laughs) called starship called starship nice nice segue good segue man that's like a vince carter 1996 dunk right there oh (laughs) i did a segue without saying the words speaking of wow this is a new day except i just said it didn't i yeah well, remember this shiny so steel trash can looking thermos thing that's out in Poca Chica, Texas that I've been eagerly watching since <laughs> forever for months and months and months. <laughs> well, how many aborts did you go oh through? My God. Well, here, let's just look at my poor channel because it was like, <laughs> do not watch this. Do not watch this. Do not watch. Do not watch. Look at the past four are scrub. Don't watch scrub. Don't watch. <laughs> um, and before that, it was uh, Static Fire. Yeah. We should probably watch the Static Fire first because this was um, the actual Static Fire. Let me think. When did that actually happen? It was near the end, and I got out of there right away. Um, oh, that was it. When did it? Oh, yeah, this is the one where, oh, I got to tell you guys a story. So <laughs> we kind of find out for sure they're doing it. And Rachel and Jean, who record for me, you know, they, they live on South Potter Island, and they boat out there to this uh like right outside of the exclusion zone they just have this place where they where they shoot and so i'm telling them I'm like oh guys are saying that there's venting the roads clear pads clear and all of a sudden people are realizing like oh it actually is going and this is literally right when i got off uh the recording of of our ludicrous future last week so i'm texting them, get out there get out there they put out there as quick as they can it's low tide so they had to literally uh, carry their like pull, uh, drag their boat like a quarter mile or a half mile through the, like this low tide and set up right up and we went live about one minute before static fire and i was just like could not believe it so i was just elated that they, that they got there in time and uh and that we happened to catch it and this was the static fire. this is one of the things you know this is the big milestone is making sure the engine works and doesn't blow itself up or doesn't catch the stuff on fire. You know, like this is <laughs> people are always like, what's so exciting about that? Because it only lasts like two or three seconds, you know, but it's like you got to validate a lot of systems here. There's literally hundreds or thousands of valves and, you know, sensors and all these things that need to all be OK. And I'm just sitting there like, did we make we made it in time? And I'm still thinking like it's not going to go. It's not going to static fire. We've seen this a 100 times, right? And uh and then it did. I don't know where it is, <laughs> but it's in there. Okay, here we go. There it is. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we're just sitting there waiting, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, finally we see the the flash of the engine, and uh, it's still a, a definitely a pucker moment. As soon as you see it, like again, our thing's gonna catch on fire. Is and now we know that big purge must be right when they're doing startup. Mm. And look at that. It is just perfect. 
And then this is, as soon as it was done, it detanks itself. I learned actually a lot about the detanking process. Uh, I, I got to talk to, uh, not engineers at SpaceX, but I was talking to some engineers about, uh, I just still don't understand like the, the pressure and all that stuff. But basically, you know, you have helium to back pressure to fill up uh, the actual tanks to make sure that they're at their operating temperature, at their operating pressures. Um, most rockets fly at three, pre, uh, three bars, so three times atmospheric pressure. So they're like, you know, want to burst, basically. Uh, we think SpaceX uh, with the Starship is closer to five or six PSI based on tweets that Elon's talked about with operating pressures and operating loads and stuff like that. Um, and so that's what the first thing they do as soon as like something happens, as soon as they're done static firing, or if they're not going to fire and they have to scrub, they detank or they immediately depressurize down to it. Cause it is, you know, the vehicle's under a lot of stress like that. So that's the first thing they do is to save it. They get rid of all that excess pressure. So that, that that's just helium. You're basically seeing vented immediately. And then, uh, then once it's safe, then they start to recirculate the liquid oxygen and the liquid high, uh, liquid methane in this case back into the tanks. So that stuff doesn't really get lost, but it takes, a while because it warms up in that process and it takes a long time to, to reset because they do have to chill it down. But needless to say, it finally static fired last Thursday, right when we got uh, done with the show. And then this happened on <laughs> Monday. Was it Monday or Tuesday? Tuesday. Tuesday. Boom. They went for the hop finally. They went for the hop. <laughs> and how awesome is that? I mean, that's... It looks so controlled. It looks so controlled. It's, it still looks so uh, abstract. Yeah. <laughs> like it's it's not a rocket. It's just this steel thing, and it's got this one tiny little. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, per, you know, compared to the rest of it, plume coming out of it. Right. And it just goes up and comes down. There's the legs. It it looks so bizarre. It really does. Mm -hmm. It it yeah. it's like unnatural. It's not supposed to be doing this. Right. It, it's the same thing when I saw Starhopper fly. You know, you could kind of see Starhopper there uh, mm -hmm. still in the foreground. When I saw that fly, this is in slow-mo now because we do shoot these in 4K, 120 frames a second. Um, but so when, when I saw Starhopper fly, my brain literally, with my eyes, I couldn't yeah. quite comprehend <laughs> like, it. what's happening? Well, especially when you drive up to these things and see them, when you stand next to them, they're huge, like really, really big. They're not small you know mm -hmm. so your brain comprehends the size and the scale and then when you see it flying it, it, literally i had this like moment of like i, I just can't I, I can't fathom like what is going on and it did by the way did obliterate the launch pad a little bit parts of the launch pad so there'll mm -hmm. definitely be some refurbishment so i was wondering about that because it because it is sort of off center and it kind of had to slide a little bit when mm -hmm. it first took off like um yeah. I'm I'm guessing that's why it kind of like went right over the top of the the side of the right. launch pad or the launch mount. Exactly. I think that's what most speculations are is that you know it does that slide. And the reason it does the slide is like you said the the engine's offset. The engine's yeah. off center, um off axis. So therefore in order to fly straight it has to angle itself and at first before it angles it's going to induce some horizontal translation and it did and no big deal and they accounted for it. The other thing I wanted to point out was um Notice the the little cold gas thrusters firing there. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure they only had two cold gas thrusters on this entire thing on each side to control roll. Literally think of like, I, I did that video a while ago with Amy Shearer Title uh, for that Facebook watch show where we made hovercrafts with two hover, they're little hovercrafts and then we use fire extinguishers, right? And those were our thrusters. And you can, with two of them, you know, one on each side, you can, you can either turn left or right or fire both of them that can help you push forward. But that's literally the control they had for roll was just two facing the same direction. Fire one, it rolls you left. Fire so one, it crazy. rolls you right. And that's it. And otherwise, the engine gimbal is the main way you actually control it. But if as far as roll control, mm -hmm. that's it. Two thrusters. <laughs> that's all I you guess need. Better to keep it simple. Yeah, exactly. Just the whole concept of, I guess flight and space flight being kind of obviously separate but like in my head i'm always thinking an airplane like right. you need wings <laughs> to fly right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now a rocket or can go Bull. straight up and that's it like in my head like oh yeah it can it can just blast off but it can't like fly <laughs> and here it is flying like that's the the dissonance going on in my head right now is like what is happening like it looks mm -hmm. so perfectly controlled 
Mm -hmm. They really did the the tune the team that tunes all this stuff and developed the the flight algorithms and everything really got this thing to be buttery smooth. But now I did want to say, although it looked like it was about perfect, you know what? It may not have been so perfect because once we saw SpaceX's now this is that's how about that for some clickbait. Um, did the COPV <laughs> fly off again, like on, on it, Starhopper? It it went much better than Starhopper, but it still wasn't perfect. Let me show you guys. So this is SpaceX's view. Again, I'll I'll let. So we're watching the Scroll. launch here. I'm not sure if people can hear that. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> From there, you can really, really see the launch pad yeah. just getting. The launch pad did not have a good day. No, <laughs> and I see all these you memes. Thought you of got like, a lot of sun. I, yeah. I see all the memes of like reusable rockets. You know, like people up in the air, and then or like it's it's ULA like reusable launch pads, expendable rockets, and then like SpaceX <laughs> like reusable rockets, expendable launch pads. <laughs> but notice this. So then we get the shot from. There's a fire in the engine, right? I saw mm. this. Yes. You are seeing correctly. There is absolutely, without a doubt, a fire. <laughs> Not in the engine, because that's where the fire is supposed to be. There's a fire oh, right. on the engine. On the engine, yeah. <laughs> on the engine. And that's and not supposed to be there. And it's not necessarily supposed to be there. Now, don't forget, I mean, okay. um, you know, th there could be residual things. You know, th there could be literally, like, lubricants. There can be, uh, like, hydraulics. In this case, they're using RP-1 as a hydraulic for the thrust vector control, uh, or at least they were. Maybe now they're getting into using methane for, for the hydraulic control. I don't remember where they're at right now with this. Um, you know, there could be all sorts of cleaning solutions and things that are on the outside of the engine that are now just on fire because of the conditions, you know? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it, well, it obviously wasn't bad enough. The engine, you can tell by its plume, is just maintaining perfect composure, you know? So that it didn't affect the engine. And by this time, it looks like either the exposure is so bright you don't even see the flame or it ended up going out just fine, you know. But regardless, the vehicle was perfect. It, it, you know, it landed absolutely perfectly. Um, but some speculation here. There's some people saying, you know, that it, that it again, yeah, like cleaning or something external to the engine. Other people just saying, you know, uh, those are really high pressure lines. It doesn't take, a, it takes just a tiny, tiny leak of that to have a, an external fire. And it doesn't mean it's catastrophic. Right. Like you can have just mm -hmm. tiny little leaks. You wouldn't want that, you know, for all of your engines all the time. But it's a, we'll say that Not it's normal. Like this is the definition of normal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like it probably happens, but it's not necessarily supposed to happen, but it's not catastrophic. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. And in Discord, yeah, people are saying um, that, you know, SpaceX didn't have to release the video with the fire. Like they didn't have to show us this angle. But they did, but they and did, yeah. and it's just cool. They showed us, you know, a glimpse of that. But still, like it, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully, I mean, if you want, if you want to reuse a vehicle over and over and over again, a fire like that is probably not what you're going for, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. But um, but but we haven't gotten confirmation as to exactly what that is yet. It's all still us just kind of speculating, right? And yeah. in the grand scheme of things, the Raptor is still new, and already that's seal number twenty-seven Raptor. Remember how last year they're flying like number seven for Starhopper, like six and seven were being used. And now we're at 27 and we're literally well into the thirties now. It's like, they're just still making constant improvements. Like all of these, every time they go out to the pad to fix something, that's a data point for them to make an improvement. Mm. Plain and simple. So yeah, there's, it's still not perfect, but it's also like the most advanced rocket engine in the world. And it's being iterated on still weekly, basically. But I think they're getting a lot closer to like proper flight articles. Um, and we're going to see. So basically what's next is I think they're going to do more hops. I don't know if they're going to do more hops this year. Number five. I don't know if they're going to do more hops uh, with with six. If they're even going to use six. They have serial number eight being stacked right now, which is a little more advanced. Likely we'll have the aero surfaces on it. Um, but I think they'll probably almost the wing re type things. Exactly. The flaps. Um, my guess is they're going to probably almost repeat this again just to try to make the operation smoother. Try to make improvements to fuel up, you know, maybe Once not have the engine the start on fire. Again, right? Yep. <laughs> just kind of get better at this process. And Elon's even said that, you know, people were asking Elon, so what's next, basically? And um, and let me let me find that actual reply so that I can quote it and not just um yeah, so uh 
Elon said, we'll do several short hops to smooth out launch process, then go high altitude with body flaps. So, um, so expect probably more like this. This will probably become fairly routine, just like it did with the grasshopper and the F9R vehicle. Um, and they'll just get better at using methane. They'll get better at fueling up and pressurizing the vehicle at disconnecting from the launch pad that, you know, not having the launch pad explode every time they take off, you know, they'll just be <laughs> making improvements from here. And hopefully it just means a quicker now, you know, think about how much they learned now that they did have some success and don't have to start over from scratch on a new vehicle. They actually at least have one standing there, although standing at an angle, I feel like I should say that a lot of people are like it's crooked, mm. but those are oh, version really? one legs. You know, and it landed on one side and then probably rocked back to the other. And there's no way to like re-level. They'll eventually make beefier legs. I think already for the next one, they're going to go with beefier legs. And then eventually yeah. on said version two will have auto leveling. It probably, uh, it seems like, I mean, it's, it's really bizarre how it looks unstable with all those legs. Cause there's a short little, little things, mm -hmm. you know, compared to like, like the typical like tripod style. Right. But just thinking about it, your your margin for error has to be a lot higher when you have twenty seven legs or however many versus <laughs> three big ones. Right. Right. Like I imagine one or two of those could not work entirely right, and it would probably be in a better situation than like mm, one of the right. legs not working on a Falcon <laughs> Nine. And yep, that's it. Bye bye. Yep. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's true. You could, when you have six like that, you have some redundancy. You have a leg out capability. You know, you could have yeah. one literally not even fold down, probably. Right. And probably still land and be okay. You know, if you had more, eight, ten. Yeah. How many are there? Could have. There's only There's six. Six. Yeah. Ah oh, man, it looked like there were more. Maybe I'm just. Maybe I was thinking of the render like someone did a while ago. Yeah. So, it's cool stuff though. I mean. Yeah. Joe, what are your thoughts? Because you've been paying really close attention to this. And, and you, you even had a video come out on your TMI channel about the hop that I want to yeah. go see. But So there, there was something I was going to bring up here. Um, and I saw it this morning. Um, so, yeah, the TMI that I did, what was it, yesterday? I put it out yesterday. Uh, it was basically just kind of re reiterating what I had said the previous week here about how I feel like Starship and the, the the development process of Starship being so open and public and there being such a like media ecosystem around it is, is so cool and inspiring and it's bringing people into uh, the aerospace industry that maybe never were interested in it before. Um, that's what the TMI video is all about. And in fact, right here in, in Discord, uh, be messing with you. <laughs> Brett Messenger uh, said space. He was talking about the fire and the engine that we were just looking at. And mm -hmm. he said they didn't have to release this video. That's why I like them. They show us so much more than anyone else. So that was like a big part of what I was saying in my TMI. So I wake up this morning <laughs> to uh, a tweet that somebody had sent me. Let me pull it up here. Where uh, can you see it? So he, it says ironic that just yesterday I was I posted a video praising SpaceX for the development of Starship, blah, 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 blah. And it's referring to this picture that was posted of them putting up a wall <laughs> around the launch complex. Right. Do you know anything about this? Yeah. They're... Are they trying to get some more privacy or is it more of like a, a, a fire break kind of thing? I think it's more of a safety thing than anything because, right. yeah. I mean, privacy, sure. Obviously, like they probably don't want everyone looking at absolutely everything they're doing every second of the day. They could have some ITAR <laughs> violations, you know, there could be mm. um, there could be things that could lead to big legal trouble doing it completely out in the open. And frankly, yeah, I don't think they intend to have every second of everything published publicly. It's just been the way it has been. So, yeah, but that's what's kind of blown me away is they've well, I, I don't know how cool they actually are with it, but they've allowed it so far. <laughs> I mean, they, they didn't have to they don't have to let your guys go out there and shoot those things. They could probably. I mean, I know it's public land and everything, but, you know, they could flex if they wanted to, but they've allowed it to happen. And and like I was saying in the in the TMI, it's like, um, uh, who is it that I'm watching? Usually it's the, the NASA space flight guys. I mean, it's just like mm -hmm. a 24 seven video rolling out there and like a, a piece of equipment will come out and it'll have some writing on it. And everybody will like speculate on right. what exactly that writing means and everything. Yep. And I mean safety and 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 i what do you call it? itar violation yep yep all of that aside it's also trade secrets yeah there you know there's there's other companies that are doing this that there's you know quoting competition with um so i've been kind of amazed that they're just allowing this to just happen out in the open like this and i think it's cool 
Um, but I didn't know if that's what this 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 wall was about, or if it was because it looks like it's pretty close to the to the launch. I mean, it's right there where the Star Hopper is. So I, I figured it was something about breaking the the dust or something. I don't know. So the, well, the the Star Hopper moved, and it's now just right next to the road. So it's off okay. from like the launch pad and stuff. Um, and it's basically just now like a monument slash like they're using it for a. <laughs> cameras and radars and like they're just sticking Weather stuff to it and stuff. Like at this point it's just a, a cheap tower for them you know yeah um but i think it was just a matter of like resources at, at that point in time like why spend time on that when that's going to slow them down why dedicate mm. money and and teams to like making a private thing when it's like we're they're sprinting so fast that even if they leak some trade secrets it would be five more years before someone else got to that point you know <laughs> yeah yeah but at the same time, like they, uh, I think it's just now to the point where they have a big enough team and they're they're building out a, a legitimate enough infrastructure. That they're finally like, okay, now let's actually put up some proper walls, you know, yeah. stuff like that. Well, you don't want the same situation you just had in the Florida with the splashdown, right? You don't want people right driving their trucks up there, taking pictures next to it, you know, graffitiing their name on stuff or whatever. Well, last year, that guy it, it is Texas after right all. the day after the Starship event. There's that guy that the the, it was really windy at the Starship event last year, and one of the fences blew down at the Starhopper pad. And a guy, I was sitting there shooting uh, the tease for my video where I'm like, you know, doing my stand up at the beginning. Not only was he interrupting me in the middle of shooting and like recording me <laughs> filming, I'm just like, dude, no. But as soon as we're done, he's like, guys, you should go down to Starhopper right now. You can just walk right up to it. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, the fence blew down. You can just walk right, a, right up to it. I'm like, it doesn't mean you can walk up to it. Like it's still private property just because the fence is like. I was doing like... parkour on it earlier. Come on. <laughs> yeah. And he took pictures of Starship or of Star Hopper with all everything. And he got absolutely, he got arrested. They caught him Whoa. about to fly home at the airport and took him to jail and slapped oh, him with wow. some major fines. Because of course <laughs> you're trespassing. Like it's posted everywhere. No trespassing. Like just because the fence is blown down. <laughs> it's like they're, they're they're doing all this out in the open and they're being so so open about everything it's like you gotta have a boundary somewhere you know this is still private property you right. can't just go walk up there right so yeah some of it's probably just like proper security too now to have a, a real life fence instead of a just a chain link fence and stuff like that you know and it's like a mixture between privacy like and security. A, a velvet rope around the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Stay yeah. back. Stay back. At SpaceX, we do things luxurious. <laughs> There's a bouncer. Yeah. For, yes. <laughs> For no reason, just standing out there, just looking. Bob yeah. said. Yeah. In a suit. Yeah. You, you guys on With the list? Thing. You on the list? Let's see ya. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're full. We're at capacity. There's no, it's just giant field with no people. I don't care who your daddy is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. So that's that's SpaceX's insane week. Like realistically, you know, you can basically put August 2020 down as as a huge, huge moment for SpaceX history, where they successfully demonstrated they can not only fly humans and return them safe uh, and do all that stuff flawlessly, but now they're really demonstrating a lot more advanced. Uh, prototypes of starship and now that they've done that get ready because they're they're firing on all cylinders out there and they are going absolutely wild <laughs> when firing what firing ah firing on all raptors and uh yeah i, I just expect no I mean, well, <laughs> actually the starship is a cylinder yeah they're firing oh, underneath all cylinders yeah. see <laughs> okay now if That's tesla true. if somebody said tesla was firing on all cylinders that wouldn't make any no. sense no i would i would throw my coffee at them immediately that's right <laughs> there are no cylinders in a tesla <laughs> but realistically i i just expect things like i was hoping to see like this kind of pace last year because that's what elon was talking about but of course i think he was being too optimistic about their current capacity and output but now like seeing the capacity of the site seeing how quickly they're doing things and seeing that now they really did demonstrate that they know what they're doing. And it's not just a bunch of pieces farted together in a tent. Like I think they're ready <laughs> now. You know, I think, I think it's time we're, we're going to start seeing this become routine and that's exciting. Well, speaking of Elon talking about things. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> you guys ready for a non-space story for real yes. quick? Hot yep. second. Do we have to? Yeah. 
Yeah, this is actually pretty cool. <laughs> uh, and it is, I guess, really, it's pretty similar. Um, all right, so the uh, El Cybertruck, uh, it's sp- <laughs> that's Spanish for Cybertruck, um, <laughs> is... Is that Cybertrucko? <laughs> uh, what would it be? Um, Camioneta Cyber? I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, <laughs> apparently, they're going to be making a smaller one for our friends across the pond there in Europe because the Cybertruck is already too big for America. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> it is ridiculously big. And um, Elon had previously said something about that um, from the prototype that they were considering reducing the size by about 3%, uh, but then kind of walked that back and said, yeah, never mind. Uh, even 3% is is uh, too small, so it has to stay basically the same size as the prototype, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, and then now <laughs> um, that they're Elon's saying on Twitter that uh, Tesla is highly likely to make a smaller version for Europe. Now, apparently, you know, this makes a lot of sense because pickup trucks in Europe aren't really a thing. Uh, if you need to haul something, you just will rent a trailer, and, and you know most cars mm-hmm. over there have trailer hitches on them. So, mm-hmm. uh, so it's not like here where you know trucks are sort of a status symbol, or or even just p- normal. You know what I mean? Like, like where mm-hmm. I, I mean, and Joe, where you live, especially, and probably Tim, where you live too. Like, a tr- having a pickup truck is just kind of a, uh, it doesn't seem weird, right? It's no, just a normal car that you yeah. buy. Uh, but apparently, I remember. Yeah. Sorry, just to add on to that. When when I was in college, a friend of mine was from England, and uh, he was always just fascinated. Of course, this was Texas, so there's a lot of them. But he was always fascinated by all the trucks with nothing in them. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, to him, it was like people driving around forklifts or something. It was yeah. just like it, it's made for a purpose, and it's not being used for that purpose. What you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's definitely a different men- mentality over there for sure. Yeah. Well, and that that goes to uh, I did a video on it a while ago about how towing is a completely stupid metric that doesn't matter because no one actually tows stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. There are some massive surveys uh, done with like 250,000 people every year responding to this massive survey and something like 70 plus percent of people never tow anything ever. <laughs> and you're going, why the hell do you buy this you know, thing? Um, but if you even just look at trucks in general, they clearly have, at least here in this country, have departed dramatically from the concept of like a work related vehicle. Uh, of course, the truck companies still make those types of vehicles, but the vast majority of them are like have four doors. They have like leather interiors. They have these big, beautiful yeah. touch screens with mm-hmm. infotainment systems. It's like a luxury car that is more functional, I guess, is how I would look at it. That's why you can easily price out uh, a really high end uh uh, F series Ford or something like that, well into the eighty plus thousand dollar range. Like I think when mm. you look at the price of the Cybertruck, it's it's incredibly competitive uh, for what you get out of it. And so, so yeah. So anyways, there it is. It's going to be a bit smaller for Europe. I personally would love to see a smaller one for here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I still want them to make a more normal truck. Um, in addition to these comments here on Twitter, Elon was on an interview recently where he talked about, oh, yeah, maybe we'll make a more, uh, you know, quote unquote, normal looking truck. And uh, and, and that was not new. It, it came across. I even had people uh, like tweeting at me and calling me like, hey, did you see they're going to make a normal style truck? And I'm, I'm like, yeah, he said that in the very beginning. <laughs> if no one yeah. wants to buy the Cybertruck, we'll do that. But guess what? A bazillion people put in reservations for a Cybertruck. Mm-hmm. What percentage of them will actually you know, go to buy it is is a bigger question, but there's tons of demand for the Cybertruck. So as much as I would love Tesla to make a more normal style truck, uh, I don't I don't think there's any incentive for them as a company to do it whatsoever. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. but there there may be something else here related to the Europe thing with some kind of regulations or some kind of vehicle weight credits and those kind of things. So, well, and the, half the reason why vehicles are generally smaller in Europe, of course, is because the roads are smaller. The town city centers are like based on horses, you know, like yeah, driving around like, you know, Perugia, Italy or something where the even in the most compact car, you're, you yeah. know, folding in your mirrors, you're still like the pedestrians have to get up into doorways, mm-hmm. you yep. know, to let you pass. Like you're not fitting a cyber truck there. I'm sorry. No. I did, however, see a Lamborghini one time go through the tightest, scariest streets of ever. It probably was, they're probably filming Top Gear or something, but like it was literally <laughs> the tightest streets 
I was terrified to drive this compact piece of junk, you know, that was worth a grand or something, you know, like mm-hmm. rental car. And here's this Lamborghini just cruising up like it's no big deal. I'm just like, dude, I mean, literally like this much room yeah. on the sides of the mirror. They probably, sometimes. yeah, they're probably every from day. there. Yeah, of yeah. course, and do that every day. And it was, what's funny is when you're over there and there's like all this tight, like you go into this weird state of mind of just like whoa that looks dangerous yeah yeah <laughs> but but you're just like oh whatever like when when we got married over in uh, Positano Italy and I mean yeah it's the, the roads are that wide like it's mostly like not rickshaws but little like one seater kind of things that are most people are on scooters really right and and you go to a restaurant and they have seating outside by the road and you're literally like inches inches yeah. away yeah. from the road car. and cars are just like doing this and yeah. you're just like whoa <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm probably well, gonna die. <laughs> when when yeah. Jenny and I were in Brussels one time, it was we had the similar experience in in downtown. I don't know if it's really called downtown, but like what we would consider downtown with all the bars and restaurants and stuff. It's so old; it was like before cars existed, right? And so the yeah. the streets are like cobblestone streets, and the only thing it, like there's no cars allowed. Even it's all walking. The only time you yeah. see a, a, a car, it's not really a car. It's kind of like a scooter with a big thing on the back to deliver like vegetables right. to a mm-hmm. restaurant or something like that. Uh, and and it was the coolest thing ever. And I, I loved how that was. I really love the idea of, um, in fact, now with COVID here in San Diego, a couple of neighborhoods have done that where these other popular streets where there are a ton of bars and restaurants, they just completely close the roads off. Like you can no longer drive a car mm-hmm. through there. And I think it's fantastic. I really yeah, think mm-hmm. we don't need to be fetishizing this idea of bigger cars and bigger roads. It's just, it's stupid. It's a waste and, of money. And you have to park totally. literally in front of the restaurant you're eating at. Like, yeah, we are right. so lazy in that aspect. Like walk yeah. three blocks, walk yeah, four blocks, good for our get over it. Fat bums. Yeah. <laughs> uh, have I told you about the most Dallas thing I've ever seen? Oh. Uh-oh. An old if rip F one fifty. If it's if it's the most Dallas thing, that's going to be the so, most. The... Somebody cracked open a rock and there was an F one fifty in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, there, there's a place called the Truck Yard, and it's it's a place where like they have a revolving uh, food trucks. So it's it's basically like a big patio area outside, mm-hmm. and every day they have different food trucks that come by and you can eat there. So anyway, um, there's a parking lot right next to it. You have to valet. You have to valet to eat from a food truck. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is the most Dallas thing in the world. Yeah, that's bad. I don't get it. Why Why is that a Dallas thing? Because it's like, it's, it's like pretentious? Lazy, or... um, in certain parts of Dallas, especially the Greenville area, like um, it's, it's pretty much you just have to valet no matter where you go. Mm. You don't really have a choice. Mm-hmm. And and what so kills sad. me is like th- in this particular place, especially you go up and it's a totally empty parking lot. <laughs> you can right. just go park there. Yeah. Uh. And that's why when I, when I first got my model three, um, I, I went to uh, a restaurant. Sorry, we're on a little tangent now, but I went to a restaurant and I had the guy had to valet park it and he had no idea how to drive it. It was brand new. And he was just like looking at it like it was a spaceship or something. And and I had to like show him how to drive my car. And he literally just like backed it up about 10 feet into a parking spot. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I came back out, I just used someone to like roll it up to me and I still had to tip the guy, you know. Right. Oh. Anyway. Yeah. Speaking of which, have you guys ever used auto park where you're mm-hmm. like parallel parking or, or even perpendicular and it, it, you know, pops up and you stop and then hit a button and do it? Have literally you ever done that? like twice, maybe three times. Uh-huh. Joe? Almost never. I have. It's it's easier for me to just park. It's like yeah, it, it's easier to just do it myself. I was filming yesterday some Model Y stuff, uh, which will be not on my channel soon, but on a different channel. And uh, I I was trying to demo that because it, it is one of the features of full self driving that doesn't exist for regular autopilot. I could not get it to work to save my life. I spent thirty <laughs> minutes pulling up next to cars, pulling up next to curbs, trying to be- just just zero, just whatever, you know. And then, like, when I'm pulling into my driveway, it wants to do it like into the rocks, into like <laughs> a, a wall. <laughs> like, what yeah. the hell? So I was just curious if it's just like a, oh hey, you're filming, it's, screw it, you, or if it was like um, a, you know, because you know how nothing it ever seems works. really random. It's, it's very so random. Really ran- like, like sometimes, like you just said, like I'll be backing into a spot and it's like perfect place to do it and it doesn't do it. And then other times I'll be sitting at a stoplight. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, like, would you like to parallel park between these cars next to you? It's like, no. Parallel <laughs> park on top of this motorcycle that's here. Like, yeah. Wait, no, 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 no. I get that a lot. There's a a coffee shop that I go to, and it is uh street parking, but even if I'm just driving by and I'm just stopped, not not reversing, just like gonna go forward, but there's cars, it'll want to do that. It, like onto the right. sidewalk. Like there's right. definitely not a place to park there, but it just something on the road lines or something. It thinks that that needs is. a massive. I think they just haven't touched it. Like I think they've been focusing yeah. on so many other things that I think they haven't even looked at it again. And I think they're waiting until just the neural nets like smarter and better at identifying that before they even, you know, it seems like, like a pretty low hanging fruit, but yeah, they're probably bigger. You know, you're not really going to be like, no one's going to be dying if that doesn't work, right? But if right. like autopilot doesn't yeah. work, right? Yeah, maybe a bit more risky right. there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, should we take a quick little break? I was about to suggest that. <laughs> Let's do Here's it. Here's a quick word from our sponsor. We'll be right back. Today's ludicrous sponsor is Skillshare. Yeah. Yes. Dun dun dun. To the cool Skillshare footage. It is actually really uh, <laughs> so. So you know what I realized? It's actually been almost four years since I worked in an office. Wow, Dang. that's amazing. That is. It just occurred to me, like last night, I, I couldn't sleep because it suddenly was like, wow, it's been four years since I. Worked so what was it? Late twenty sixteen. Um, yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Pretty much at the end of twenty sixteen. Wow. Tim, have you ever so, worked in an uh, office? I'm, I don't I'm, think you have. Not really. No. <laughs> <sighs> Sorry. You're missing out. <laughs> yeah. You ever worked in a restaurant? Uh, I did when I was really young. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, that that's an experience I think you have to have. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? What it has to do with is is you know over the years I've had to learn how to be productive on my own without a mm. boss standing over my shoulder and making me do stuff. And to that point, with everybody working from home these days, probably a lot of people are struggling with how to stay productive and keep from going insane, whether you're working from home for a job or unfortunately don't have a job right now or are on a hiatus or something. Anyway, uh, one thing that we can recommend to everybody is Thomas Frank's Productivity Masterclass on Skillshare. Uh, Thomas is a productivity expert and a YouTuber like some other people you might know. And in this class, he shares some of his best tips for living your best life. This means organizing your digital files, organizing your inbox, taking notes, task management. Uh, he doesn't teach how to grow an epic beard, but he probably <laughs> could because his is pretty epic. Um, but this is just one of hundreds of classes on Skillshare, covering everything from business essentials, graphic design, marketing, video production, cooking. If you have an interest in it, there's probably somebody there that can teach you how to do it. Yeah. On Skillshare. On Skillshare. On Skillshare. So join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for our listeners. Skillshare is offering our ludicrous future listeners two months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free to you from Skillshare. Thanks to us. Cool. So to sign up, just go to Skillshare.com slash OLF. Again, go to Skillshare.com slash OLF because I know Tim just is just dying to do the third version of this. Skillshare.com slash OLF. Can we get it auto-tuned? Yeah, ben. Skillshare.com slash O L F. <laughs> T Pain will thank you. Was that a chromatic like auto tune? It sounded like it was completely out of key by the in between notes. <laughs> I am never out of key even when I'm out of key. <laughs> How can it be out of key when there is no key? Ooh. I make my own key. <laughs> <laughs> Twelve notes. That's all you got. Why don't you just That's music like, auto, in the key of me? Why don't you just auto tune it to like I don't know something basic like you know C major or something? Like why don't they just? Why? Well done. How about that? There you go. Mm-hmm. Hey, how about how about that? Oh, it's Trevor. How about that? Uh, cash cash that outside. <laughs> uh, so this comes from Trevor Senek in our Discord. Sesnik. Uh, Ses Sesnik. What did I say? Tr- Senek. Yeah. There's extra S. Trevor. Trevor <laughs> Sinaik. <laughs> Trevor, Trevor writes, Trevor writes Trevor. for everydayastronaut.com. A- he does what now? He writes for everydayastronaut.com. Oh, does he? Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, this is biased. cheating. Biased. He has an is in. It? I didn't know that. Yeah, he's oh. got an in, but hey, I don't choose these, so I'm, I don't want to interfere. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm never picking Trevor again. No, <laughs> oh, no. That's no. it. Blacklisted. I'm just kidding. He does good stuff. Anyway, Trevor asked. 
He says, I have no idea how to phrase this as a why don't they just, but <laughs> let's just give it a hashtag why don't they just. But given what Doug was saying about only being able to tell its day after re-entry on Dragon due to the windows being super, super sooty, that's hard to say, <laughs> uh, how is this not going to be a problem on Starship? Seems like even the leeward side would get fairly sooty due to laminar flow. Ooh. So I did not know the answer to this, but I thought it was an interesting discussion to have. Well, won't the uh, pod on Starship be way higher up than Dragon? Or am I not understanding where? So the sooty part on that's covering the windows is because the they're so close together, no? Like I feel, or yeah, is Starship- so, so close to the heat shield is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Like the plasma stuff is all coming right there and the windows are like right there. With Starship, won't it be a much better taller bigger capsule coming down well don't forget the windows are on the yeah the it's almost like an airplane coming in belly first so it'd be like Uh the bottom of the airplane and the windows are on the top you know not like not more not like a rocket or a capsule where it's like the god windows are on like the front you know and the heat shield on the back kind of you know yeah windshield wipers easy solved (laughs) done (laughs) well there's there's ben's insight what do you think joe (laughs) I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm really, I don't know. Um, I, how, I mean, so when you say it, if it's a problem, does that just mean that it needs to be re-cleaned between every single launch or maybe replaced fairly often? Um, I mean, you don't need to see out the windows to fly the thing or anything necessarily. Right. It's, it's just it's just for viewing. Right. Um, so I, I don't know. I I. I just thought I don't know. <laughs> no, yeah. say. I mean, is it is it a, is it a problem at all? That's yeah. I I actually I think you nailed ex- pretty much exactly the first words I was gonna say again, Joe. Like you've been killing it lately, man. I don't even what what I say. I think I I think the the right frame of mind is it is it a problem? Oh, okay. Well, like is that a is that an issue? They're not controlling anything. It's all well, computer guided, so. Is he Who talking cares? about though when it becomes intraplanetary type travel and you know oh, people right. want to see outside? <laughs> when you're landing on Mars <laughs> and you still have a year and a half on Mars and then another seven months home, like you might want to look outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Something like that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I need to see the void that I'm in the middle of. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me give a few this is just I, I have no idea, actually. Like I don't know the answer as to why the windows exactly get city. But I do think there's two things that are going to be a little different on Starship that might help it be less city. Um, number one is uh, is that the uh, Dragon Capsule uses a, a completely ablative heat shield. It uses Pika X. So yeah, yeah, yeah. intentionally, pieces of the heat shield are constantly being wicked off. You know, they're being burnt and wicked, and they they go right up on the walls of the spacecraft and might get stuck in some of those laminar flow, the recirculation zones, and stick to the spacecraft. You know, um, and some of that is due to the type of heat shield, I'm sure. Um, I would assume, actually. Uh, I might be wrong on that assumption, actually, because I don't know the exact answer. But but then uh, what they're use they're going to be using. Uh, 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 I forgot what it's called, because I think it's not turf rock. I think that's what comes out of the, the boring tunnels. What's it called? Or what do they call the stuff that's a, is turf rock? What comes out of the boring tunnels? The stuff they're using muck. <laughs> That's what no, it's there's called. Isn't that a band? There's a name. There's a name. And there's another name for the and then I'm forgetting the uh the name of the the heat shield tiles, what they're made out of for, for Starship. But they're not they're they are ablative, but like very, very, very little amount of ablation. Like they're not their primary mm-hmm. thing is just they're basically a really good insulator. Um, but they, they do ablate a little bit. Um but second, the the gas thrusters, the coal the because through reentry they're the thrusters are firing, and those thrusters that help control roll are at the bottom of the spacecraft. So their exhaust plume would go in towards the windows. And, you know, like we said earlier, it is a biprop hydrazine fuel, which does have carbon in it. There is some carbon. Mm. There would be some soot buildup just from using those thrusters. And that could easily end up on. Um, uh, uh, Randy says, I think Tim is there is wrong on there being laminar flow at all. Uh, I was just using the assumption that, that Trevor was saying laminar flow because I don't know if there's any laminar flow either. Uh, I think it's more turbulence that would be producing, um, mm. you know, in, in negative pressure zones circulating 
um, alongside the out inside the the bow shock against the vehicle. So yeah, I don't know if there's any laminar flow at all. That was just a sorry. I was reading it from the why don't they just. Um, so I think, but the, the thing is, that the Starship will end up using methane for its thrusters, which burns clean. There's still a little bit of carbon, but it's just not sooty. Like it's not, they're not like long chain hydrocarbons or anything. So it's, it's not sooty really. It burns almost completely clean. Um, it'll produce carbon dioxide, but not just like carbon soot deposits, you know? So it might not be an issue to begin it with. It really just might not be, if not an issue, not nearly as big of an issue. And maybe that's something that if on re-entry, you know, on entry to Mars's atmosphere, if it is bad, maybe they'll have to put, you know, uh, uh, one of the mission criteria is to clean the windows. You know, maybe yeah. that's something they just simply have to address. Well, I guess... Um, Rain X, I'm telling you, works. <laughs> <laughs> what, what makes it interesting to me is, I mean... I guess I get worried that it's going to go down the space shuttle path, which is like, oh, it's going to be reusable. Oh, well, actually, it's going to take hundreds of thousands of dollars and months to refurbish it between. And I know that that's specifically what Starship is trying to not do. Right. Um, but it might be little things like that that add up and add up mm -hmm. and add up that over time it's like, oh, we actually do have to clean this and or replace purge that these windows. And do this yeah. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me think about this now. Uh, someone mentioned in, in Discord um, about the space shuttle. The space shuttle windows were totally clear when it when it entered, and its heat shield was not ablative. Um, its heat shield was just purely a huge insulator, um, mm -hmm. and they they just held on to all the heat. They trapped all the heat and just slowly dispersed it after it landed. Um, so the, the, the oh, okay, you know, so maybe it's not necessarily an issue. Maybe it has more to do with the, the heat shield and the the thrusters. I don't necessarily oh, know that's but. a good answer i and, hadn't thought about that and the, the the windows on the space shuttle will be more similar to windows on starship kind of like ben was saying where the windows are more out of the way <laughs> more in the <laughs> wake you know per se in the in the leeward side than they are uh they're still pretty in some stuff during re-entry for dragon Ben's like i said a smart thing too <laughs> <laughs> i know yeah. things I watched but, Destin's video on laminar flow. Come on, <laughs> I know but, and just are. to just to iterate on on what Neurostream said, um, that basically he was asking or saying like, does it get sooty going back down or also going up? It it doesn't get sooty going up. Um, it it wouldn't. There's nothing that that interferes. Um, and Unless and Rob taking off from Houston maybe. Rob Speed says that of course the shuttle came back in a different angle. Yes, of course. Like this is. It comes in at about a 40 degree angle. Starship will come in closer to 90, probably more like, you know, 75 to 80. That degrees. is going to be so insane to watch. Yeah. Uh, it's, well, yeah. I, I yeah. mean, if there are aliens watching us, they're going to see that and be like, nope, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> like, they clearly don't know what they're doing. <laughs> there are people on that thing? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, yeah. What if what if that's what this is? You know, all this all this space stuff we're doing is like a reality show back on some other planet. They're they're like <laughs> what is that check in next week that? for them to try this dumb maneuver. <laughs> boom boom boom. You know. <laughs> yeah, there's a South Park <laughs> about that exactly. Oh, is there? Yeah. Like the real world. Yep, it's uh, right. called canceled. Where Earth's about to get canceled. Yeah, it's where the aliens. Right. Uh, one of them they they want to take on uh, a friendly look. So one of the aliens after like a hundred different attempts of like trying to like be friendly they're like no that's dumb no too scary like they ended he ends up being like a taco a giant talking taco that poops <laughs> ice cream is what the alien makes itself look like so they're not scared nice that's what we need in our yeah. life speaking, yeah. speaking of things out there in space yeah that poop tacos cool okay. <laughs> <laughs> that poop tacos pooping tacos things in space that are pooping tacos is that what your story is about Yes. Mm. Pooping tacos. Were they tacos were... that poop or eh, whatever? No. Yeah, they're tacos oh, that poop. It's not. Okay. We've now spent. That's not what we're about to talk about. Okay. God. Okay. So um, <laughs> <laughs> this is actually not new. This actually came out a few weeks ago and I keep meaning to bring it up on here and then I never did. But anyway, there have been some mysterious objects found in deep space that astronomers don't know what they are. Uh. They are there are four of them that they can see in the radio wavelengths, but no other wavelengths. They're circular, they're brighter along their edges, and they're unlike any class of astronomical object ever seen before. 
UFOs. And right now they're calling them odd radio circles or orcs. So maybe I should have started the, the, the video or the, the podcast by saying we found orcs in space. <laughs> That's true. Um, they are uh, found away from the Gal- Gal- uh, Milky Way's galactic plane and around one arc minute across. So it's they don't know if it's like deep space from another galaxy or from our inside our own galaxy or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's they've talked about ruling out things like supernovas, star forming galaxies, planetary nebulas, gravitational lensing. Um, all of that's been ruled out. So they don't they don't really know what this is. It says it's mm. a. It's a new phenomenon that we haven't fully probed yet. That's according to Christine Speckins, astronomer at the Royal Military College of Canada and the Queen's University. Hmm. Hmm. So, so it's a yeah. new celestial object. We've not. How did we? Yeah, they don't. They don't know what this is, but they're giant uh, radio objects that are circular, and they're like bright around the edges. So they're like big donuts in space. How did we just find a bunch of them? Like, how did that happen? We went from like none to like, we found four or multiple. Uh-huh. Well, it sounds, I mean, it, it is crazy, right? Like it, uh, who Scott Manley did that thing with the asteroids where it shows like a timeline of what, how many asteroids we thought there were. Right. And, mm-hmm. and it's just insane. And every year it's like, oh, there's, you know, 80,000 more that we didn't previously know of. Right. It's insane. Well, exoplanets. Yeah. Exoplanets too, especially. I'm still fascinated with this whole Planet Nine concept, where there's like mm. a massive because the orbits of the planets don't quite add up correctly. Yeah. Like, and so you there has to be something else that's creating just a little bit of an extra pull in another direction. Otherwise, it because yeah, the whole orbital mechanics stuff just doesn't really work given what we know about the current planet. So there has to be something else. Mm-hmm. Like I, I I love that stuff because it's it just shows how. Uh, just how much we don't know, you know? Yep. Yeah. And- well, so, um, uh, yeah, that's how we found Neptune was the orbit of Uranus was off and there was something perturbing it. Right. I, I, I still need to get a shirt made that says Uranus is perturbed, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like they, they did the math and we're like, well, it should, if there's something there, it should be right about there. And they, you know, looked up there and there it was, they found Neptune. Um, but then they started noticing that Neptune was similarly kind of those something perturbing its orbit. And we've never quite figured out what that might be. Um, when looking for that is when Percival Lowell found uh, Pluto. But Pluto is like way too small to yeah. do anything. Like well, that. and there's that whole thing about how like we all kind of owe our existence to Jupiter because of how it pulls oh, yeah. us further out and whatever. And, and why is Mars so small? It should be way bigger than what it is like all these kind of unsolved mysteries in our own solar system when we'd all feel like, oh yeah, we've, we've figured it all out. And literally we have no, like so many things are just completely unknown. Yeah. 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 Well, you were asking how they found this. It says right here, it was the evolutionary map of the universe survey from um, the Australian square kilometer array pathfinder. So it was the emu from the ASCAP. <laughs> um, it has 36 dish antennas, which work together to observe wide angle view of the night sky. And that's how they found them. Wow. Yeah, and Maybe then another the one was the it's on the, it says the they found the fourth one, uh, in India. Oh yeah, cool. Oh, and that's awesome. Then by having another different way of observing it, it helped uh, astronomers realize it was real, not some kind of issue caused by the the ASCAP. <laughs> <laughs> Damn ASCAP, Wait, Joe! You did a video about that, right? Where it was like a radio frequency that they thought was something, and it turned out to be the microwave in the building or something like that. Um, I've heard that. I don't know if I've put that in a video before, though. It was There's like been uh, one, it, it, one, it, it, is it when they discovered the signal from the Big Bang or something like that, where there was like this radio signal that they couldn't explain. It turned out, you know, something about the microwave, and 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 at the same time at noon every day, <laughs> the, the signal would appear. Right. Well, there's right. that story, and there was one, and this goes way back to when they had those big like bell shaped. Um, was that a microwave dish or? A... Maybe that was radio, but anyway, there was there was a bird's nest inside of it. <laughs> yeah, I was say, they, yeah, they thought that they had found poop. something, and it turns out there was a bird's nest in it. Yep, I remember that one. So no, no bird's nests here. They <laughs> they did verify it was somewhere else, but anyway, that's awesome. We found a new thing in space. I think that's worth talking Good about. Good job, yeah, Australia, for started for leading that one. But speaking of people on the opposite side of the globe on the southern hemisphere, Australia's neighbor, New Zealand. <laughs> this is a bad. Se- that was trying way too hard. 
Way too hard. Oh, well, we had some really big news come out um, from Rocket Lab. As, as you guys remember, their 13th flight was unlucky, number 13, even though I guess internally they were calling it flight 12.999999999 because they didn't want it to be flight 13. Oh. <laughs> and String it didn't matter. It didn't matter. <laughs> um, so they, they did a, a webcast yesterday that was really cool. And uh, it, they, they did like a full-blown Q&A with Peter Beck, their, their CEO, and, and Morgan Bailey, who's their comms director. And this is after last, oopsies, after last week, they, uh, they ended up telling us what exactly they figured out went wrong with their 13th flight, why it failed. And really, the, the, short, the long answer is, the short answer is a long story, and it's not even that long. <laughs> there was a connector connecting basically the batteries to the, the engine pump, because don't forget, they're, they don't use turbo pumps. They use electric pumps on their engines to feed the engine, right? And it's a really cool system. Uh, but there's a connector that apparently just experienced a new type of shock because obviously they have to be able to remain connected. And that's the connector's job. But they just found this certain fringe case that cropped up for the first time in this flight that made it so it was just kind of slightly disconnecting and reconnecting and it was ended up soldering and melting the connector and basically frying and disconnecting itself or whatever. Uh, so they found a new failure mode, and in doing so, they actually just re they they figured it out right away. It sounds like you know their data. They just go, oh, clearly this was doing this. They were able to replicate that in the lab, find exactly how it was working, and then mitigate the issue. So it's one of those unknown unknowns. You don't know it's going to fail until it fails. Um, and now they found a new failure mode, made for a safer, better connector. It sounds like um, I, I tried to get in the Q and A. I wanted to get the exact like I wanted to hear how they fixed it exactly. Like what. You know, did you add more this or that or what, you know, what goes into that? But in light of all this, they're already working on returning to flight because it was a nice, easy fix, because that's kind of the beauty of like a digital rocket like this. There's way fewer like there's a lot like a lot of the stuff is just literally wires and software. <laughs> you know, um, if something goes wrong and you have enough data on it, you can just quickly figure it out right away and get back to flight immediately. So they are conducting, um, they're going to do another launch. And it sounds like this launch is, is going to be, I, from my understanding with the press release, they're doing a dedicated launch with no customer payload just to confirm, which is very generous. I feel like that's not necessary, honestly, when you're, you know, have proven that you've already flown to orbit 11 times previously. Um, you know, and yes, I say 11 because their very first launch was not successful. Uh, but uh, 11 times, I think, was their, their previous number of, of successful flights. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm surprised that they're doing a dedicated launch just to prove their prove to themselves, but good for them, I guess. Um, why not? So you know. just have like a dummy payload on board? I think so. That's my understanding. I, and I should have asked that again, but um, that is my understanding. I'll, I'll try to clarify that. But meanwhile, when they now they kind of talked about the, all this, that's great. You know, back to normal. No big deal. But meanwhile, they all of a sudden let us know that they made some big upgrades to their vehicle. And now, thanks to battery technology, because that's that's one of the th cool things is that they're riding on the improvement of batteries. You know, batteries is one of the most competitive industries in the world where mm -hmm. hundreds of companies, if not thousands, are constantly working on making better batteries. So they can just sit back, watch development happen. And then be like, boom, we want that new battery. That new battery is a X amount increase in our in our capacity or, or lighter weight or higher output or whatever. Because of that, you know, the Electron previously, you know, it was probably they were probably working on five year old batteries, which in battery technology is, you know, pretty old. But they now are starting to work with a new battery. And in doing so, they've increased their payload capacity from about 225 kilograms to low Earth orbit to 300 kilograms to low Earth orbit. So that's substantial, about a 30% increase in payload capacity just by changing out batteries and probably something to do too with their, um, their biprop hypercurie upper stage as well, or hypergolic upper stage. So how freaking cool is that? That is crazy, yeah. Yeah, so already making upgrades. We're learning more and more about the hypercurie, which is um, going to be on their photon. They just keep talking about, I mean, all of a sudden they're just going nuts. Like their team has, let me see if I can find this. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, the other thing is they're, they're, in, they're making an expanded payload fairing. So they're going to have a bigger payload fairing so they can take better advantage of that 300 kilograms 
Um, but they also were showing, I mean, they released this new um, user's guide and we just get a better sense. This is the photon interplanetary configuration. So they went from this being the regular photon low Earth orbit. If you're looking at this, sorry, it's just this tiny little kick stage that has some solar panels and it's kind of basically a miniature satellite bus. Nice and easy. Stick your payloads up on top of it. That is now basically your satellite and your maneuvering system all built into one of each other. The customer doesn't need to build avionics and navigation and a thruster. They can literally just put their science on top of it and go to space in a hurry. But then there's a, um, th this is the opposite side of it. So you're looking at, this is where the customer's payload would attach. But then now we have the photon interplanetary configuration where it's, where it's actually using hypergolics, green, green hypergolic fuels. They're calling it green, meaning like not anti, but like not as uh, dangerous to work with and handle. Um, and it has this hypercurie engine, which is another electric pump fed engine. So it's not just prep, uh, pressure fed. It is electric pump fed, which is super cool because what that means, and he's saying they're finding out, like he realizes, uh, he talked about this a little bit yesterday in the live stream. He's like, you know, we realize that this is probably one of the best uses for electric pumps because we can have some battery capacity. We don't have to lug around all of the batteries for a burn. We can lug around just some of the batteries, recharge them on solar, because, you know, some of your burns, like going to the moon, will take eight burns. So then they can have like weeks or a oh. week to recharge or days, I guess, you know, a day to recharge the batteries, do your next burn and only carry the amount of battery necessary for those burns and therefore reduce your 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 payload mass or your 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 dry mass. And it's like, holy cow, you kind of have like this rechargeable, <laughs> you know, rocket motor. Yeah. Which is really cool. So he's saying like that the Hypercurie <clears throat> will end up, you know, basically be a platform and a, a new bed that they that they could sell to other customers. This could be flown on a, you know, Falcon 9 for interplanetary missions. Like it opens up a lot of cool possibilities. Really so that cool interplanetary stage that you just showed, that's uh, they're, they're looking at sending small sats out to like Mars and. Um, for the sure, the they have system? a payload going to the moon relatively soon. Like, I think it might be one of their first missions on the Hypercurie will be, um, will be going to the moon for NASA for part of the, the capstone uh -huh. uh, program. And then uh, e uh, Peter Beck really wants to take something to Venus. He's like obsessed with Venus. And cool. I think I want to do a crowdfunding thing, you know, and help try to see if we can send a private payload to the to Venus, not to the surface, but. He talked about there's these areas in the atmosphere where there's theoretically. I want a cloud city on Venus. Yes. I think that's I think that's actually a really interesting idea. Yes, and he I, thinks that you know there's the, there's theoretical papers that we could potentially even observe life in those conditions, in mm -hmm. those in the atmosphere even. So mm -hmm. I would love to send a dedicated search for life and slash get photos of Venus, you know, in the that crazy part of the atmosphere and yeah. How wild would but that those be? would launch on an electron or a Falcon 9? Those can launch Falcon on an electron. Oh, on that? an electron. Wow. On a, the little tiny electron rocket can send the Hypercurie out to Venus. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. So so to blow your mind, Ben, looking at the face you were making anyway, yeah. the, the cool Cloud thing about City. Venus. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, the pressure, the air pressure on Venus is so strong that like at the surface, it would be like us being about a thousand miles below the surface of the, the ocean. Yeah. Just instantly um, crush that's, it. Yeah, yeah. So, so that means that in the upper atmosphere of Venus, um, the temperatures and the air pressure is closer to what we have. And so, so any kind of even semi-buoyant vehicle could just float on the top of Venus's atmosphere. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, a rocket already is, yeah. you know, lightweight and already has like pressure tanks that can be, you know, like make it buoyant. And you can basically just park it, <laughs> set it down on the atmosphere and wow. float it around like a boat. Yeah. Lando Calrissian. <laughs> Exactly. And if not, you know, you could do some kind of inflatable thing that, that does for sure make it buoyant that at the right area. Cool. Not sure yeah. Venus is the place out I'd, I'd ever really want to be, but, you know, I, I think it'd be cool to see these things. I mean, we definitely don't want to fall off of it. But, <laughs> yeah. you know. We definitely need more. But you wouldn't want to fall there. off of it in the ocean either. So it's the same thing. That's true. But, by the way, Tim, uh, my son, um, I told him that you weren't going to Mars and he was very upset about that. Uh, <laughs> but he did ask if you would go to Saturn and get one of the ice crystals from the rings Ooh. and bring I that would, back when I uh, would try since, to do since that. You're not going him. to Mars. We assume you're going to Saturn. 
Of course, that's the next. Discussion. Saturn's closer, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, easier to get to. Way you know. easier. Super easy stuff. It only takes you know nine years to get there or something. So, <laughs> yeah, know. no problem. Yep. But so I thought that was really cool. So again, to reiterate on Rocket Lab, they they had uh they basically after their launch failure, they they came back with a better connection connection. Oh, I didn't even mention they're working on a, a drop test. So it's still Flight Seventeen. Their goal is to not try to swoop it up with a helicopter, but it is to just recover it in the ocean. And mm-hmm. because of that, the parachute they'll be using isn't going to be a parafoil, like not one of those steerable parachutes. It's just a ring parachute, a regular parachute. The, they practice dropping that. They're they're very confident that they can hopefully try to recover a stage. And then from then on, at, after mission 17, take a look at how that turned out, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then assuming things went well, um, then they can just, you know, go forward from there and work on eventual recoverability, like actually properly recovering it before it splashes down and see how things go. And hopefully nice. we fly. Cool. He said, he said, even for us, if we can reuse it once, you know, because someone asked about the refurbishment, like he's like, we don't know yet, but if we can reuse it once and it's worth our time, that's what matters more than money. If it turns out that we can reuse it multiple times and actually bring the cost down, then we'll pass that savings on to our customers so that we can, you know, make, you know, fly more and, and get be more competitive, like, of course. So. Yeah. Yeah, I need to go watch that video. I saw it pop up, but I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. It's fun. I mean, just even listening, just Peter Beck is, I feel like the whole team, I, I've said this a few times, I think, publicly, that I just feel like they're so chill. Everyone's just <laughs> so, like, they're they're just excited. They go with the flow. They make just, like, plucky decisions, I feel like. And they, I don't know, they're just, their their company culture is just so, like, hey, let's do some cool stuff and, like, let's just be friends about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, they're they're awesome. I would. They're one of the few companies that all, almost could get me to to not work for myself. Like I would. Mm. They they're tempting. I really like them. Yeah. And you get to live in New Zealand. Which jeez, can you imagine? Can you? Which they're is, totally open right now. Like. Yeah. Because they have coronavirus zero cases. free, right? Didn't they uh, declare? Cool. Like for a month or some now, like at yeah. least like six yeah. weeks, they just have been like literally no cases, period. As soon as I uh. heard that, I was trying to book a flight, but they wouldn't let me. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, a friend of mine, a lady I know, she, um, I think she's married to a Kiwi or something. Like she's got dual citizenship somehow. Mm-hmm. So they've always bounced back and forth, but she uh, was in LA <laughs> at the beginning of COVID and she got it and she like documented every day what she was going through with it, which is terrible. But um, afterwards they, they went back to uh, New Zealand. Anyway, she posted something the other day on Facebook about how like, it's totally back to normal over here. Nice. <laughs> like, you guys have no idea how mm. it's just totally back to normal. Mm, it's, like, it's like the just... pandemic never happened over there. Can you imagine? Cause yeah, they did, the, they nice. did the listening to experts thing. Oh, <laughs> And did yeah. what they were told. Weird. Uh, and uh, didn't get all stupid about my freedom. it. So what do you know? But my freedom to go outside and do whatever I want. I'm going to drive my well, boat not, up to not the Not to go down that road too much, but that was one of the things she was saying in, in this post was like, this is actual freedom. Yeah. Like, we can just do whatever we want. We don't have to wear anything. We don't have to, you know, quarantine anything. But if you go there, did the thing at the beginning, if yeah. you wanted to fly there now, well, you probably, if, assuming you somehow were allowed, I, I think you'd have to quarantine for a couple of weeks as soon as you land. She right? did. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, she was talking about that. Like they, they literally like, I mean, almost sounds like prison or something, but they put her up in a place and she wasn't able to leave, but they took good care of her. They brought them, brought them food and just gave them everything they needed. And yeah. And they just had to hang out in this place for a couple of weeks. And then they were like, okay, you're good. Go. That's kind of, do that. you know, my whole head on this thing is I feel like here in this country, we have just a, a one size fits all policy for everyone when <laughs> I feel like we could be much more effective uh, in terms of actually helping reduce cases or do deaths if we could just be smarter about it and more targeted, you know, <laughs> we'll like have the like... con- contact tracing and then isolation. Like it doesn't have to be everybody. Not everybody is as well, we should you know, have susceptible like and stuff, prescribed but... thresholds. So it's not some shock. Like it's like if you get to this point. In your community, where the infection rate is this, the blah, blah, blah is this, your hospital capacity is this, you go to this next phase, blah, 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 and have it be, like, federally mandated so that there's actually some vision and some, like, based on numbers (laughs) and statistics and science involved and not just leaving it up to someone that's never even, you know, a mayor that, no offense to mayors, but they probably aren't (laughs) 
experts in pandemics, right? So like, yeah, don't let them be the one to choose. Just have it be a mandated thing. So it's like, there's not that diffusion of responsibility. It's kind of like an algorithm that decides yes. you know, some smart rules. Yeah. And you know, it's funny too, because we've had like a quote unquote surge here in uh, San Diego the past month or something like that. And I mean, I can just tell you, like we went to the beach to go for a walk, just like a typical thing we would do. And it was insanely packed with tourists. Like nobody there was from here. I could tell you with certainty, 80 plus percent of the people were not from here. Most of them, I would, if I were to guess, were from Arizona. Total common thing that happens. And Arizona's like not on lockdown at all. So, you know, we're having a quote unquote surge out here. I'm like, I can tell you that we were the county that was out of all the ones in California that misbehaved. We were the ones that behaved the best. And while everyone else was shut down, like LA was shut down, we weren't because we, we heeded the advice. And now I look at it and it's so frustrating. So, you know, you can't even control it. Even if you and everyone, you know, are still doing the things you're supposed to be doing. It's like just out of your, it's frustrating. Yeah. It's like you're doing your part, but you're still, you know, shouldering the burden and getting penalized. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but you can't like close the state's borders. I don't think that's right. allowed, you know. So sp- speaking of doing your part and, you know, your part not working. Mm. And yeah, stuff, let's hear it. We did finally get a, a proper update here from Virgin Orbit who had a part not work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who remember, Virgin Orbit is is kind of the the si- the sibling company to Virgin Galactic where they are going orbital. And what they're they're doing is they're basically dropping a giant missile off of a 747. Um, the 747, of course, has a extra pylon for transporting spare engines across the country. That's a, a normal part for 747s, I guess. Uh, and so they have a 747, and they drop uh, this giant. I mean, it is a massive orbital class rocket off the side of it, and they went for it in what was that May? Uh, you know, right? Yeah, I think late May. They went for their first orbital flight. And it lit and everything went fine. The drop test, the drop part of it went fine. It ignited its engine. And then after a few seconds, the engine failed. So they did a full-blown, of course, investigation. And these investigations like this require the FAA and some of their uh, customers, in this case, their customers, NASA, for one of their first flights. And I like this. They go, uh, I just want to read this because this is a really, really good, um, this is just as perfect, like, how you go about an investigation. Uh, And I just think this is an excellent statement. In the business of launch vehicles, finding the direct cause of any failure of any flight is incredibly important, but certainly not sufficient. In order to truly get to the root of the issue, it is important to ask why after why after why. If the answer to the first why is because the high pressure locks line failed, then the second why must be why did it fail? That, in turn, must be followed by more whys, including why didn't we anticipate this failure? Why wasn't this failure observed in our earlier testing? And more. To all those, you must add in a healthy dose of what else could have happened? Uh, What would this failure have looked like if it had occurred at a different point in the mission? And hundreds more questions. Creating a robust fault tree or fishbone diagram is important especially for those visual learners. I just love that because it shows like, you know, what they actually have to do when they're investigating a failure and look at like how many other things could have this affected, what else could have happened. And I just, I just really, uh, I liked that, that paragraph a lot. Um, and so what they've done is they've, uh, I, you have to read this statement. We'll, we'll have it linked in the description, but it's just really well written up. I really like their company culture because they they just talk a lot about, you know, how they're doing things. Um, and so they, they learned a lot of good data because for once they finally had the vehicle under power. So they now know about the dynamic loads. They know more about, you know, how much it vibrates and all of that type of stuff. So they can really pass that knowledge off to their future customers, uh, with some proper data, which is good because otherwise you're just kind of guessing. So now they have real data, real flight data, even if just for a second, but of most importantly, of course, they're fixing the root cause issue, which was that the high, uh, the oxygen line basically, uh, or the high high uh, pressure oxygen um, line burst and stop providing oxygen high pressure. So after the, the, ter- uh, the pump, uh, it, it burst and was no longer feeding the engine high pressure oxygen. So yeah, um, but what's interesting, that was, so that was a demonstration mission and their next mission was supposed to be their first orbital flight. And the customer was NASA with like a handful, 11 or 13 
um, CubeSats for NASA for the NASA Venture Class Services Program. So they basically came to NASA and they're like, hey, so, you know, we're going to fly another demo. And NASA was like, no, 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 we're we're ready for you guys to fly with us. If you're, you know, if you're if you know what the root cause is, go ahead and why don't we fly on your next mission? Like, well, we'd rather mm -hmm. demonstrate that we can get to orbit before we launch payloads for customers. Um, and oh, it's 11. So the what's nuts is that NASA basically talked him into it, saying like, well, this is kind of part of the venture class launch services is we want there to still be some risk. And we're investing in that so even if this second launch is a failure that's kind of part of this program is the inherent mm. risk of new launchers uh you know of of these smaller launchers and and they're willing to risk the 11 cube sets um wow. and that's what they're doing i guess and so they're hoping to be back at it and and flying this mission for nasa um by by the end of the year is my understanding that's amazing hmm. now this yeah. is not the tourist version this is the commercial side correct this is the orbital uh totally oh, different split vehicle. them out a while ago right yep so virgin galactic has kind of that that weird looking dual fuselage plane with the rocket plane underneath yeah. it they go suborbital they come back down and it's a 20 minute ride basically or i guess 20 minute like flight ish uh this is a proper orbital rocket but it's still they still love the air launching they're launching it off of the wing of a boeing of a 747 I feel like we've so. done a, a half dozen why don't they justs about that same thing and being like, yeah, it's not a good idea. And then here we are. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's definitely hotly debated. You know, is it worth all the <laughs> extra effort and all the all the things, you know? Because cause like the if I remember the the general thought was you'll get to that. However high it can take you, your rocket would get there in like 15 seconds anyways. Just right. from the ground or something like, yep. like in no time at all, you're you've already gained all that back. Right. And and you you're if your rocket's at that altitude, it's already traveling like way faster than the jet. You know, it's already yeah. probably gone supersonic. Yeah. <laughs> like it's it's got a lot of inertia behind it. Um and the general consensus is really always been it's just easier to have a regular launch pad where you can service the rocket, do all the things. Because the the pros of having it up, you know, an air launch is that you can use a more vacuum optimized nozzle and you gain a little bit of, you know, you gain a little bit of altitude, you gain a little bit of velocity in your general direction, but it's not substantial. Yeah. It's maybe a couple yeah. percent, um, maybe maybe a five or 10 percent gain when you factor in everything or something. But you also have a lot of extra complications. One so. thing that I thought was interesting, you said there about the asking why and all of that. It reminds me of my corporate days. We, we, uh, I think Robert or no, who was it? Guy, Guy Kiyosaki, uh, Kawasaki. He was, uh, he's an Apple guy from, I don't know, the eighties. And he is kind of like this business thought leader guy now. And he had a, a thing where he, that he talked about, they did, they called it a pre-mortem instead of a post-mortem. And they asked all those mm -hmm. questions before they did anything. Like what can go wrong? How's it mm -hmm. going to go wrong? How can we plan for that thing to go wrong? Right. And hopefully, pre not not prevent those things necessarily, but be prepared when they do. When something goes wrong, you already have, you've already laid it all out, like what to do right. next. Mm -hmm. Right. So that makes a lot of sense, I think, especially in a case like this where you're, a launch is like a literal thing, not just like, <laughs> hey, we're announcing Instagram Reels today. What could go wrong right. or something? You know what right, I mean? Right, that right. kind of a thing. So. Yeah. And Good on and them. just to just to iterate back though to the air launching capability, uh, of course, Andrew. Uh, in our Discord does say uh, the plane can take you to a bunch of different starting locations. That That's one of the cool things is, is the airplane can get you above weather, can get you uh, onto different inclinations. So you can fly down to the equator if you're wanting to do a fully equatorial launch. Uh, you can do, you can fly to all these, you can fly to the country of origin. Say they have a, a top secret payload that they really don't want, like, you know, having to be transported all around. You can fly to them. Uh, they can integrate the payload themselves or with their team or whatever. And and be more secretive about that, right? Or or whatever. There's a lot of you can basically bring the launch site to them and then launch from anywhere. So it's it's. I mean, there's pros and cons. And after hearing uh uh Will Will Pom uh Will Pomegranz no Pomeranz. There we go. Will Pomeranz from Virgin Orbit. He's uh I think the head of like their uh something business or something but hearing him talk about it he he's they've thought it all through and it's a really cool trade-off it's a classic like interesting to see that one company can get to this point and that conclusion that it is worth it all 
one others don't. So it's fun to see like what was their trade off. And one of the biggest right. things that kind of closed, I think, and made it worth it was actually using a 747. And not just for the fact that, you know, obviously it's virgin, so they could buy one from or, you know, uh, what's his they name? Have. <laughs> they, yeah, he basically just, yeah. I think got, they got one for cheap, you know, um, because of Richard Branson. But not only that, uh, the, the cool thing about a 747 is service wise and things like that. You know, there's there, like there's hundreds of mechanics that have worked. There are thousands of mechanics that have worked on 747s. There's thousands of pilots that know how to fly a 747. There's thousands of 747s with parts, spare parts that they can use. Yeah, it's a as common. opposed to when they build a specialized aircraft, you have a very small team, a very small parts bin. You know, like now we have a 747, which like is one of the, you know one of the most flown and serviceable vehicles. So it, that was it's a cool it's a cool thing and uh, yeah. I like that. Yeah. And taking all that into consideration. Yeah. Cool. Well, can I give a shout out to my friends, speaking of mechanics, that are doing Mm -hmm. something really cool with Mm -hmm. not parts that are serviceable? (laughs) Yep. My friends over at EV West, who you guys may be familiar with, are aiming to get the land speed world record for an electric vehicle this weekend at the Bonneville Salt Flats, just mm-hmm. east of, or uh, sorry, west of Salt Lake City. And it is the coolest looking thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> this is called a, are you guys familiar with these at all? This whole oh, concept yeah. here? I feel like oh, Tim, yeah. you probably I, are. I had a Pinewood Derby car that looked just like that. <laughs> yeah, this is called the Electro Liner. You can check it out on, on Instagram. They keep posting well, stuff there. And let me real I quick say that. Route. If you if you need to know about uh, Bonneville stuff, the best movie for that is World's Fastest Indian. Yeah, yeah. Have you guys it. ever oh. seen that movie with Anthony Hopkins? Yep. Speaking of Kiwis, yeah, but like uh, that was an awesome, awesome movie. Yeah. So, so this is a whole deal. So the Bonneville Salt Flats are what you think. It's you know this big flat salty uh, surface, and they're taking they're, they're making what they call the Electro Liner. It's Technically, a Lakester is the style of vehicle, which mm-hmm. comes from a belly tanker, which was the original kind of style where the wheels were sucked up inside of the body. Basically, it's like the same thing. And those belly tankers were actually like fuel tanks from old World War II planes. Mm-hmm. And and they would take those like, you know, r- like recycle them essentially and turn it into a car. And so these guys are doing that. They have... Uh, there are these Panasonic uh, prismatic batteries that I think I can pull it up on Instagram. Uh, th- that they've got they've got uh 35 kilowatt hour packs, and they've got uh, a custom body and everything, and a Tesla Model S uh, performance engine. So there's the there's the battery packs. So that so they actually have three packs because wow. you're out in the middle of the desert. You can't. There's not like a supercharger. So. <laughs> And the, and the way it works, I do have a video coming out about this, uh, speaking of what we're working on. But uh, the way that the, it works is you have to go for a run. And if you get it, it's called a record run. You have to actually take your your speed, your average speed for your fastest mile. So you have to meet. Mm-hmm. So if you, someone says they have the world record for an electric vehicle land speed, that means that, that whatever it is, like I think it's 212 miles per hour. Uh, that means that they average that for over or for a full mile in order yeah. to for it to count. And then you have to go take your car back. The the team there has the bon- the people running it have to check it out and make sure that you didn't do something illegal from the last time they inspected it. And then you have like four hours with it or something for you to go do it again. And that's called backing it up. And if you do it twice then you can uh th- th- then you officially broke the world record so for them they built these custom battery packs uh these are the chargers on the right side and and here's what the the battery pack looks like inside of the car and uh and it's it's a swappable because they won't have time in 4 hours to right. charge it from the mm-hmm. solar panel trailer thing that they're bringing out there uh, wow. so yeah, pretty rad stuff. And I just wanted to give them a shout out and say good luck guys, because wow. this is about the coolest thing that I've ever been able to see. And I got to go tour it, uh, last week or so. Here's a little video of it. Oh, Whoa, that's, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> what are they, what are they, what are they targeting just to beat the record? Do they have any estimate of theoretical it's... top speeds or anything? Yeah. So, so the record I, I believe is 212 or 213 miles per hour. Uh, 
they are going to so they're trying to beat that right that's like like 300 the primary target by the way uh but in addition what they're doing is uh, when they've tested it uh on their own just the motor itself i believe they said they got it spinning up to about 350 miles per hour so that's like theoretically how fast it would go what it's geared um, to. but of, but of course the problem with with that is uh you know, there's friction and in, in your gear ratio. There's like a lot more than just how fast the motor goes to how fast you can actually go yeah. through the air. Uh, but and yeah, so I, right now this was like, like let's do part. this if we can uh, if we can figure it out. They partnered with AEM EV, which is like a new section of the AEM company. If you guys are familiar with tuner cars and stuff, they're super big into that. And uh, they're just going to be collecting tons of data. And then next year try to go for you know i don't know the overall land speed record or something like that but i don't know i, I would guess that they could wow. probably get over 300 miles per hour but but that's i think the actual land speed record is somewhere north of 400 miles per hour and and, well, and then there's all categories. these like what's that tim there's different categories because they've gone yeah. supersonic like with you know right. jet engine ones like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, the, so so the the actual land speed record is measured in mocks now it's like one point yeah like mock 1.2 <laughs> or something right and it's yeah because they have like a a, a falcon 9 on the back of it basically <laughs> right? like literally it's a rocket on wheels so this would be the uh wheel power wheel driven yeah version yep. of it wheel driven yeah not uh per, you know propellant driven or whatever yep, you call propulsive. it propulsive yeah so anyways wow. good luck guys yeah. stay tuned super cool stay safe. I, It'd be so rad to see this. Oh, I hope they get so some. So when good are they footage. doing this? So it starts this weekend. Is when the so you have to. There's a whole. I don't. I don't remember exactly, but you have to qualify first, which means you have to show a certain speed for a certain distance a couple times in a row. Then you get to go like attempt a world record the next day. And of course, there's a gazillion other people that are doing it. So it depends how other runs go, if there's a crash or anything. So it's kind of like a fluid thing. But it might be Monday or Tuesday. Of uh, of next week from when this airs, uh, but they're they're already on their way out because I I remember telling them like or asking them about it they have to take almost like a full automotive shop with them because mm. like swapping that battery out I mean the thing weighs like you know fifteen hundred pounds or something you can't just like get a couple guys and lift it you know so so they have to like bring these these like crane motor thing like all kinds of stuff with them and so so they're making their their trek out there from San Diego now. That's awesome. Cool. Good luck, guys. Jeez. So that's yeah. what they're working on next week. What are you guys working on next week? Yeah, my video on that. <laughs> Sweet. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'll watch that. What about you, sure. Joe? Uh, I've got to follow up on solid state batteries. Ooh. I think that's a yearly then, thing, right? Almost. Well, I don't know if it'll be like a yearly tradition or anything, but I did one last November and it, it was one of the more popular videos and I think it might be the second most viewed one actually. Um, so I thought I'd revisit it, see what's changed since then. Um, uh, yeah. So that's no big hook there. It's just to follow up to see where things (laughs) are. Did you guys look into that flow battery thing I sent you where these guys are making like power wall things? Yeah. I, I really think that's a good use case for it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Because it's so modular and scalable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you get whatever size your house is, you could get one that's just the right size for that house. Just pour more in. The there. only thing I hated about that article was it kept saying about, oh, you don't want to tell the power wall because your house is going to blow up. And it was like, <laughs> what <laughs> are you talking? It's just like batteries are dangerous. They explode. Not this one. And you're like, <laughs> guys, with the clickbait nonsense, like you're a scientific journal. This isn't. This right. isn't Reuters, you know. This isn't the the home of clickbait. Yeah, <laughs> like we gotta have some reason for this. So let's just say that the other right. one will blow up your house. Right. right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm, I'm I'm working on part two of. Uh, I, I think I've mentioned this again last week, but I didn't get literally a single second to work on it because last week was so busy. But uh, yeah, the kind of the Artemis versus Apollo. It's kind of like SLS part two. Or we look into like, can the human uh, lander services? So that's the commercial aspect. Can all the commercial aspects of the Artemis program make up for the insane cost of the SLS rocket? Um, mm. And how is that actually compared to, you know, when you look at like another another government run moon program, the Apollo program, how do they actually compare? So we, because it's, it's hard to compare, you know, apples to apples, apples to oranges, apples to bananas, basically, with all these different ways of, of funding and between commercial and private. 
um, and, and government funding. So uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a rabbit hole. I have a lot of the work done, but I have to tweak it now that we've had more numbers come out since I originally wrote it uh, back in like, you know, March and April. Um, a lot of the numbers and, and some of the assumptions have changed, which is fun, but just finding all those new numbers and assumptions is, is kind of the hard part now. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll see. Maybe I'll be ready to shoot it uh, next week-ish if things go well. But How's the studio? Know. Coming along? Coming along. Still just like little projects here and there. One of the projects we're working on next is replacing fans in this. Uh, I have like a micro tick um, firewall that like is the loudest thing. It's this little rack mount unit for, you know, networking gear. And it's in a closet in, in the studio. And like, you can hear it's it. screaming. And it's like, <laughs> what are you doing? So we looked it up. Is that and like the, the grinding hard drive sound? It's just a constant. Uh, it's like, hmm. I can hear it right now. It's like, it drives <laughs> me nuts. And um yeah so we're working on like replacing those fans it just seems like there's still like i have some more lighting things to do and some more sound treatment stuff but you know coming along had to You're put it on pause a micro tick the... yeah that's what i was thinking yeah <laughs> uh yeah too much coffee there you go clearly so th yeah all right well it looks good thanks well thanks yeah. all for listening this side's done we'll see you guys <laughs> in our, Our ludicrous, ludicrous future. No. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching and for listening. We really do appreciate it. We couldn't do it without you. Yeah, and if you want more of us, you can consider becoming a Patreon member where you can get early access to episodes. You can listen to us record live, join our awesome Discord community, or get your name in the show credits. So head over to olfpod.com slash Patreon to learn more. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>